So we're going to talk about algae today. We started to do this a little bit yesterday, just aquatic photosynthetic organisms. And we didn't have time to go over the parts of their life cycle that talked about sex. So we'll do that now. We're just going to look at some of the differences between the algae and the land plants, this very broad group of organisms that has no formal standing in the hierarchy. So this diagram shows the land plants and the algae on the two different sides of the diagram. So we've drawn a horizontal line to, to separate them. On the left side, we see three different types of reproduction for the algae. We have cases where there are unicellular algae and the whole organism forms the sex cells. So there's, in a way, there's no specialized sex cells because the whole organism is unicellular. And so at just at some point, there's specialization that takes place. And the organisms, some of those organisms, form the plus and the minus gamete. And there's really no way to, call, to tell which is the plus and the minus. They look exactly alike. So we'll just label them arbitrarily plus and minus gamete. In other cases, we have differentiated sex organs, but they're unicellular, unicellular. differentiated sex organs. In this case, we have a non-mobile egg, and there will, the sperm will be down here for release down here, the male and the female in this case. And in the third case, we have multicellular sex organs. So all of these cells here will form gametes. Now in all of those cases, there is no sterile covering surrounding the cells, like surrounding the sex cells. And so you haven't noticed that because you didn't know there should be any sterile coverings. But if we look over here on the land plants, we see around, surrounding the sex cells, and I'll label those gametes, the cells that are going to produce the gametes in a second. But around them, we have this layer of sterile cells. And that layer can be multicellular or unicellular, depending on the organism. But it doesn't really matter. That doesn't matter for us. What matters is that there are sterile cells surrounding the sex organs. So sterile cells surrounding the sex organs. And then we have, on the inside, the cells that are going to form the gametes. And in this case, we have an egg. We'll have egg and sperm. But that's a major difference then between land plants and algae. The algae have no sterile cells around their sex organs, and the land plants have sterile cells. Now we're going to see all these different types of sex organs later on. So don't worry about that too much right now, about the details. We are going to just introduce some of these general characteristics that we're going to talk about in detail with all of the organisms as we go on through the course. So where do they occur? Al where are the algae? Well, they're ubiquitous. Ubiquitous means they're everywhere. They occur always in moisture. So they need moisture. But they can be, that can be in fresh water. Salt water can be on moist soil. It can be on snow. Sometimes up in the high mountains, you'll see some red snow. And that is not a very sick hiker. That is usually a red algae growing actually in the snow. So they can grow in very kinds of extreme environments. They even occur inside other organisms. So here we have a snail, an aquatic snail, you know, called nudibranchs. These are really fantastic organisms. If you don't know the nudibranchs, you should look them up just to learn about these great guys. And in these 
organisms part of the mantle. The mantle is a part in a mollusk that normally would form the shell around the mollusk, but in the nudibranchs there is no shell. There are the, the um, mantle has been specialized to contain algae. So there are endosymbiotic algae. inside this organism. Endosymbiotic, that's a word you've probably heard before, but let's <coughs> learn what it means. Endo, inside. Sim, with or together. Bios, life. And this <clears throat> TIC ending is a ending that means that in indicates a relationship. So inside life, with together inside life, a relationship of that. So it kind of describes what we're seeing here. We're seeing that the algae and the organism, the mollusk, have gone into a relationship whereby the mollusk provides a home for the algae, and the algae produces photosynthate that the that the mollusk uses. So it's a symbiotic relationship. It's not a parasitic relationship, but a symbiotic relationship. The, al the, the mollusk itself is not photosynthetic, but it becomes able to use the photosynthetic products because of the endosymbiotic algae. Now we talked about basic life cycles last time, and I really went kind of overboard on all the information that I gave you. Let's back up for a minute and look at the life cycles again and start a little simpler than that. And we're gonna get that complex as we go on. I'll just switch colors here so you remember that we're really doing now a basic, basic life cycle. And that life cycle is going to have two main parts to the life cycle. The haploid portion, which is always gonna be drawn above the line, and the diploid portion, which is drawn below the line, and linking those two, as you all know, is meiosis. The results of meiosis are, as we said last time, but we can make that we can make that very specific. That those spores that come from meiosis come from meiosis by calling them myospores. So spores that come from meiosis. Now on the other side we have a process that leads us from the haploid to the diploid portion of the life cycle. And that process unites the gametes. And we'll call those plus and minus gametes. And the process is syngamy. The, unite, the gametes are united to form a zygote. So that is the most basic, or the most basic parts of the life cycle. It's not a full life cycle yet. We could say those are the most basic parts of it. From the zygote to meiosis, there are different things that happen depending on the specific organism that we're talking about. From the myospores to produce the gametes, there are different things that happen depending on the organisms that we're talking about. The life cycle I draw for you last time is a typical life cycle of a higher plant, but it's not a typical life cycle of the algae. So let's look at now that our first real life cycle that we're going to encounter in the algae and draw that, the, draw that out in our basic, using our basic process or form that we just developed. Before we do this, I should perhaps define some of those terms for you that we've just been doing. And I'll do that on this screen, but I'm going to have to erase the screen in a minute. Not, I don't mean define the terms, I mean tell you about the Greek roots of it. So the terms we've used have been gamete, meiosis, syngamy, zygote. You notice we've got the root gam in a couple of these, in gamete and in syngamy. Gam, there's a number of meanings for gam, but the most, the easiest one to understand to get started with is marriage. 
So gamete, eat then is means a dweller in or for us a cell that's involved in marriage. So that's a very nice description of what gametes do. They fuse in this act of marriage in the fusing of the two nuclei together. Syngamy, well you know gamus now, marriage, syn means with or together. So it's kind of a repeat marriage with or together. I mean, it's the idea of fusing these two together. And you can see it's a general kind of term that would mean any kind of fusion of two sex cells together. Meiosis means less. Myo means less. And so <clears throat> the word meiosis is an indication that you're going from diploid to haploid. You're reducing the number of chromosomes in the process of meiosis, going less. Zygote, Z-Y-G, means to yoke. I mean like to yoke together in the sense that you would yoke two oxen to a plow. So you're binding them together. So it's what happens in um, syngamy is the two gametes are yoked together to form the zygote. They're fused together to form the zygote. So the Greek words are very descriptive of these processes that we've been, we're have been we starting to learn. Okay, I'm going to have to erase that now so that I can draw our life cycle. And we're going to look at the name of this life cycle also, but let's first draw it and then we'll try to make sense of, we will make sense of, I hope, this weird name, monobionic haploid life cycle. First thing we do in the life cycle is we draw a horizontal line. We write haploid above, diploid below, meiosis over on the left, syngamy over here on the right, Syngamy leaves to the zygote. And now we've got to fill in the rest. So if we got syngamy, we've got to have gametes. So let's put those in. And I'm just going to call them minus and plus gamete. Fusing in the process of syngamy. In this life cycle, this type of life cycle, the main part of the organism, the main part of the life cycle, the part of the life cycle where there is a multicellular organism is a haploid, is the haploid life cycle. Now that's kind of weird. We're used to life cycles like our own life cycle where the main organism is a diploid organism. Mammals are like that. Nudibranchs are like that. Most animals, most, almost everything, I think everything, almost everything in the animalia, is diploid, the main part of the organism. But that's not case of many algae. In fact, the main algae we're going to be learning next week, all of them, in fact, next week, are going to be haploid. The organism you're going to look at under the microscope, and in fact, the ones that you were looking at under the microscope in my lecture, in my lab, and in Ms. Rushford's lab this week, those are haploid organisms. That haploid organism, then, is drawn up at the top, so there is a multicellular haploid organism. And that multicellular haploid organism is going to form the gametes. Now because it forms the gametes, we use a special name for it. We call, as we talked about last time, the gametophyte. You know gam, marriage, fight, plant. So the marriage plant, or the gamete-bearing plant, if we want to stay within Greek. Meiosis, we know, leads to myospores. And the myospores are what? Grow into the multicellular haploid organism, the gametophyte. 
So what happens to the zygote in this case? Where does the zygote do? Well, the zygote does something unusual for the mammalian for what you would think of as a mammalian system. It undergoes meiosis. So it undergoes directly meiosis. So the zygote only exists in that single cell. It doesn't go through any mitotic divisions. It goes directly through meiosis. So how about this term, monobionic haploid? The term monobionic haploid tells you about the structure of the organism. Now, there's other kinds of terms we could use to, to describe this life cycle, but I like monobionic haploid. It's not the term your textbook uses, but I like monobionic haploid because it's descriptive. Now, you know all the roots of monobionic already. Mono, one, bios, TIC, relationship. So one life relationship. That is referring to the fact that we have one organism, it's multicellular, and that's the gametophyte. And how do we know that it's the haploid organism that is the monobionic part of this life cycle? That's the other part of the name, haploid. So of course, those of you who are ahead of me already know that there's going to be a monobionic diploid life cycle. Now we'll learn that one next week. So monobionic haploid, this is what that life cycle looks like. And that's what all the first organisms are, we're going to see are going to be like, the organisms in the chlorophyta. OK, the chlorophyta, our first division of algae. Chloros, green. And phyta, this is the division ending. It means plant, but that's what we don't care about that so much now. It's the scientific name of the, at the division level in the kingdom plantae. So the chlorophyta, the green algae is what we're dealing with. So all of these divisions of algae have specific kinds of characteristics, and we need to know, at least in general, some of the main characteristics of them. Now, all the plants that you've studied in introductory biology up till now have had chlorophyll A and B in them. These are the two basic kinds of chlorophylls that occur in the higher plants. And they also occur in the green algae. The other algae are going to have chlorophylls, but they're going to be different types of chlorophylls, different, um, slightly different structures of chlorophylls. So chlorophyll A and B are what's found in the al green algae. And it's one of the reasons we think the green algae and the land plants are very closely related to each other. Also, all the land plants you've learned about store their food reserves as starch. And that's also true of the green algae. They store their star reverse reserves as starch. And the starch is stored in, that's the key word here, in the plastids, which means in the chloroplasts in this case. And that's characteristic of the chlorophyta and of the, all the land plants. And finally, the cell walls contain cellulose. So there are going to be cell walls in other algae, but they often have specialized compounds in them that distinguish those divisions of algae from the chlorophyta and from the green plants. So all of these characteristics here are shared with land plants. I've been saying green plants, shared with land plants. And are part of the reason we think land plants and some green algae are very closely related to each other. There's slight differences between the algae and the land plants in their structure of their flagella. Not the structure of the flagella, but how the flagella are born. Some land plants don't have flagella at all. But there are flagella in most, not all, chlorophyta. <clears throat> when they occur, there are two to four flagella in general, not always, but in general. They are apical, and they are whiplash, and in general, they are equal in length to each other. And that all suggests to you that there are some algae which do not have apical flagella. They have flagella inserted in a different part of the cell. Some are not whiplash, and some have more than one flagellum, and they're not equal in length. And we'll learn all about those as we go on. There's about 7,000 species of green algae. That number is continually being revised. So don't take that as gospel, just to give you a sense of the approximate magnitude of this division. Relatively large. So here are the flagella. The red box shows what, we, what occurs, the type of flagella attachments that occur in the green algae, the chlorophyta. And outside of the box are the 
types of flagella attachments that occur in other organisms. So we have, this is the apex of the cell. It's the apex because this is the direction of movement. So you're probably thinking of things like mammalian sperm, which have their flagella at the rear, and they push, so to speak, the sperm forward. Algae aren't like that. Algae have their flagella at the apex, and they are like little arms up there, and they're kind of feeling the water and pulling the algae through the water as it moves. It's really cool to see when you can see the algae. Here's an example of another group. This is Euglena phyta. It's got unequal flagella, two flagella, often sometimes very unequal. Over here we have the brown algae, the phaophyta, and they have two flagella, but they're not apically born, they're born on the sides. And then these two groups are not groups that we're going to do in this class, so we won't talk about them. But you can see there's even other variations where flagella can be. Also, notice here maybe that there is a subapical placement of flagella in some classes, in some groups of green algae. In, fact, in one of the classes of green algae we'll learn later, this is the subapical. So everything we were saying has the characteristics of the chlorophyta is generally true of the chlorophyta. But if there's one thing you're going to learn in this class, that's going to be there are always exceptions. There's always exceptions to everything that I'm going to say. And so the characteristics that we've listed for the chlorophyta, there are exceptions to almost every one of those. Well, let's go through and look at some of the types of body plans of these organisms. We're not yet going to go through the individual organisms. I hope we can start on that today. But right now, we're just going to kind of get an overview of what the body plans of organisms occur within this group, the chlorophyta, so that you're familiar. You have some kind of mental space in which you're thinking about these kinds of organisms. OK, so I'm not going to worry so much about writing the names of these organisms on. I may mention them, but I wouldn't worry about so much about writing them on the board yet, but just to give you an idea of what kinds of body plans we have. So there are unicellular green algae. And this is Chlamydomonas, one of the first ones we'll learn. The flagella don't show up in these pictures, but here the flagella would stick out in this way on these organisms, and they would be moving in the direction of the flagella. Now, I haven't drawn those flagella to scale. They're a little longer like this one. So unicellular green algae is a very common kind of feature of the green algae. Uh, there's a whole other group of green algae that are not unicellular, but they're colonial. Colonial is a little hard to understand at first. So if we look at each of these cells in this colony, each of those cells is like a chlamydomonas cell. And so I'm drawing some flagella in here. The flagella would stick out like this. So each cell is similar to a chlamydomonas cell. But they are held together then by this sheath, a gelatinous sheath. that holds those cells together. Now, there's no intercellular connections between those cell, these cells. There's no cytoplasmic connections between them, so they don't communicate with each other, so to speak. They're kind of semi-independent cells held together in this colony. this colony. So colonies are not true multicellular organisms. They're these aggregation of cells. Now, the organism really does consist of these colonies, and it has, a, has reproductive mechanisms that um, are tied to the fact that it's a colony. So it's not just any old cells that have just glommed together in the environment. It's not like you just take some chlamydomonas cells and you stick them together and you've got a colony. It doesn't work. These are real organisms there. And there are these intermediate states between unicellular and, mul and true multicellular. So there's a whole line of these organisms which we'll be studying. The most complex of those lines down here is Volvox. which you may have seen in high school or introductory biology and other classes. And we'll come back to that and talk more about Volvox. Here is our first use of our
There we go. First use of our three dimensional. And I'm going to turn off the lights. Is that dark enough to see? We can put down the blast shields also. If we need to. I think it's really dark. Air for impact. <laughs> One of them doesn't work anymore. Took a phaser hit. I hope you can see it's three dimensional. It consists of the uh, individual cells. It's kind of flipping around there. It's really a nice video of this. The flagella are sticking out of that gelatinous sheath. Now, this has been cupped. This has not been colored, so you don't see the gelatinous sheath here, but you see the chloroplasts and the green chloroplasts. So you should be able to see these in lab when, next week when we look at these under the microscope, but they rarely look this good. But this does give you a good sense of what these three-dimensional colonies look like within the chlorophyta. Another type of colony, let me turn this back on. is a filament. So filaments also occur oops, in the green algae. And they are a form of colony. So they're not true multicellular organisms, but they consist of a line of cells attached one to the other by their cell walls. of drawing them like a bamboo pole here, but they actually are attached to each other. And the individual cells then do not have flagella in the filaments. And they operate semi-independently of each other. The fact that the cells can be semi-independent of each other means that a colony, these kinds of colonies can break up very easily. So fragmentation is a very type, very common type of asexual reproduction in these. The colony just fragments and continues growing. There are also organisms like this one is ulva that are have flat sheets of cells. These sheets are one to two, maybe three cells thick. And they can be really planar, or they can have these kind of long forms. Um, they're not really filaments here. They are flat sheets of cells. They're just elongated flat sheets of cells instead of being really flat. This thing down here, that's not ulva. That's uh, a red algae that the ulva is growing on top. So that's a red algae. And we'll talk about those in another lecture. So flat sheets of cells. Then we've got these really weird organisms, like this is Acetabularium, the one we named last time, the mermaid's wine cup. You can see why it's called mermaid's wine cup here. You can also see why it's called crenulata. Crenulate is this shape here. That, that's, that little ruffled shape is called crenulate. These are tubular organisms, and exactly what we mean by tubular, we will leave for another lecture because I've got to have something to tell you later on. They're really interesting and fantastic organisms. You're really going to enjoy looking at that. Let's look at the diversity of chloroplasts. So chloroplast structure. Now, when you go into the lab next week, starting next week, you're going to be given lab, some lab sheets to fill out. And you're going to work on these in your group. You're going to have to write down or identify the characteristics of all kinds of organisms that we're going to be seeing. 
one of the questions on those sheets is going to ask you about chloroplast structure. And you're going to look at some of these organisms and you're going to say, oh my god, I can't see the chloroplast. There are little tiny dots in there or they don't see them or there's nothing special about them. And that's right. That is the right answer. The only thing that was wrong about that is when you got worried and said, oh my god, that's the wrong answer. Many of the organisms that we're going to see do not have special chloroplasts. They have normal disc-shaped chloroplasts like you learned about in introductory biology. And we're going to see them in three dimensions here in just a minute. So the normal disc-shaped chloroplasts. However, a few algae do not have disc-shaped chloroplasts. They have fantastically, incredibly cool chloroplasts. And that's why we have that question there. So here we have chloroplasts that are band, not band-shaped, but they're spiral chloroplasts. In fact, the organism you look at in lab today, or Tuesday, were, had spiral chloroplasts. We didn't emphasize that, and that organism is spirogyra <coughs> because of its spiral chloroplasts. Here's star-shaped chloroplast. Here's band-shaped chloroplast. We'll see those in three dimensions in one second. And here's the most fantastic one of all that we don't get to see easily in lecture, but we will see in three dimensions later in the course. And these are net-shaped, or just net chloroplast. So those dark areas there are where the chloroplast is, the really chloroplasts that look like that. Nothing at all like these little disks. There's also, in Chlamydomonas and its relatives, those colonies I was talking about, there are cup-shaped. This is a very common type of chloroplast. They're not easy to see under the light microscope, but we'll try to show you them in three dimensions here as we go on. So here we have second three-dimensional one. This one doesn't move. We can see here. So here's a nice one. Here's just those disc shaped chloroplasts. Nothing special about these. You can see here they are at a different magnification. You can see the curvature of the cell here, here, and over here. And that's maybe what I should talk about just for a second. So the chloroplast shape, I mean, it's a cool picture. Um, the chloroplasts are fluorescing in the green here, and that's why we're seeing them not stained, but this is a on focal microscope these were taken with, and they're fluorescing in green. But the other thing we can see is that uh, the cell walls here do not fluoresce, and so they appear black, and you can see the shape of the cell. And you see the shape of the cell because the chloroplasts are pressed to the outside of the cell. They're, sti they're sticking, or not sticking to, but they're pressed out to the outside of the cell by a huge central vacuole in the middle of the cell. So these cells all have very large central vacuoles. In fact, the majority of the center of the cell is taken up by that vacuole. And one function of that vacuole, is a structural kind of function, is it puts the chloroplasts out there at its periphery where they are best situated to intercept light. So that's really nicely visible here, and something that is not that easy to see in the light microscope. So that's, I think, really cool. Ah, forgot we have the band-shaped chloroplast. Can we do that without the, with the light still on? Okay, so here's a band-shaped chloroplast. And if you can look at it just right, it's harder for me, it's maybe easier for you to see it. The band is kind of, so here's the band, you know, it's like this is the band and it's rotating like this. So it's open at this area there. So it's like a, one of those um, women's bracelets that goes around their arm. Each of those is the cell, the cell wall is dark, and each cell has one of those band-shaped chloroplasts in it. So that's one whole chloroplast that has that shape. Again, pretty neat, and not the most fantastic chloroplast we're going to see. So that's why the question's there, because in some cases we have chloroplasts that are really unusually structured. Reproduction. We said we're going to talk a lot about sex today, and it's not going to start right now because we're going to talk about asexual reproduction right now. No sexual reproduction without sex with, is probably the major way that most of these organisms reproduce. 
there's a number of mechanisms of asexual reproduction in the chlorophyta. Not all of the organisms will do all of these types of asexual reproduction. They'll do certain ones of them. And in fact, groups of organisms will be distinguished by the type of asexual reproduction that they produce. Well, what are those different types of asexual reproductions? Well, maybe first we should do some Greek again. And learn this, we didn't do spore yet, and spore is really important. Spore means seed. So literally, the root spore means seed. Now, you can think of this kind of in the biblical sense of seed, right? They thought the Bible would talk about the male seed or something like that. It means a reproductive organ, a reproductive cell. Not a reproductive organ, a reproductive cell. So in that sense, we're, the spores are seeds. Spores are not seeds, like you go to the store and you buy a nut, or you go outside and you pick a seed on a plant. They're not that kind of seed. We'll learn about that kind of seed later on in the course in the very last week. So they are seeds in the sense that they are reproductive cells, and they are spores are almost, this is one of those things where there's always an exception, but almost uniformly unicellular. Zoo means animal. So animal spore or animal seed is what a zoospore is. So this is a unicellular mobile reproductive cell, asexual reproductive cell. I'll write asexual up here which means that meiosis isn't involved and syngamy is not involved. A zoospore could be haploid, it could be diploid. There's nothing in our definition that says anything about the ploidy, it just says that it's mobile, unicellular, and it's involved in asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction means that this zoospore is gonna be produced, it's probably gonna swim around for a while, because it's mobile, it's going to settle down and reproduce the whole organism. Just from itself, just from mitotic cell divisions, no meiosis, no syndrome. So many of the organisms have zoospores, not all of them. Colonies in general don't have zoospores, not always, but many colonies do not have all zoospores, they have autocolonies. Now, the Greek root colony means colony. It's come into English as a word, and we don't know what a colony is from our general discussion of colonies already, so we don't have to define this root. You know, it's that intermediate stage of development between a unicellular organism and a multicellular organism, a, a loose aggregation of cells that are associated together but not connected by cytoplasmic connections. Auto means self. So autocolony, then, is a copy of the parent colony, a self-produced copy of the parent colony. So in general, each of the cells of the colony can reproduce just by mitosis, Asexual, remember, no meiosis now, no syngamy. Just start dividing by mitosis and produce a new copy of that parent colony. So each cell of the colony divides and produces a new colony out of it. Those are autocopies. Well, what about unicellular organisms that don't have flagella? They don't have zoospores because they don't have flagella. They don't have autocolonies because they're not colonies. So we need a new term. And this brings us to a very important point and one of the most important things you can learn in this class. There is always a new term. So I will quiz you on that sometimes. And when I say, and you know what this means, the answer is almost always certainly there's a term for that. And we're about to learn it. So there's a term for that. And we're about to learn autospores, self seeds. So this is then just a like a zoospore, except for a unicellular organism, except it has no flagella. So this is a unicellular 
asexual. reproductive cell that is non-mobile does not have flagellate and they occur pretty much uniformly in unicellular organisms and finally there's fragmentation and that's an English word now so we don't have to define it, it we don't have to use the Greek roots for it but it means the breaking up breaking up of a colony and it is most common in filaments, in filamentous colonies. Filaments can break up very easily. Well, I know you've been waiting for it, so we are going to do it. We're going to do sex now. No, no, we're not going to do sex. We're going to talk about sex. <laughs> we're not even going to talk about doing sex. We're going to talk about how it works in coral phyta. And specifically, we're going to talk about the gamete types that occur in the chlorophyta. Now, you're used to those darn mammalian systems that have no variation in their type of gametes. They are all oogamous. Gamous, you know, marriage. Oo, egg. So oogamous is egg marriage, which means there is a large, I'll put large in quotes, just means larger, a large, non-mobile, and we'll put in quotes female. It's kind of arbitrary that we call it female, but we'll call it female based on the biased mammalian systems. Large, non-mobile, female gamete, and a small, we should say smaller, small, mobile, male, gamete. So you know that system very well. That occurs in some algae. There are algae like that that are oogamous. And in fact, in some of those algae, the male isn't even, isn't even mobile. So it's a generalization. We say that the male is mobile in this. So and sometimes we have both male and female being non-mobile. And in fact, the whole red algae are like that. The algae, red algae have no flagella at all anywhere in their life cycles. And when we get to them, we're going to have to learn this incredibly complex life cycle that has, that's been probably evolved to compensate for the fact that they have no mobile gametes on that. Just getting you excited for what's coming. Other types of gametes. Well, there's isogamous. Iso means the same, literally the same marriage. And let's look at the other root here. And means not. There's a couple roots that mean not. So the same marriage and not the same marriage, or the same gametes, if we could say, to make this even more comprehensible, and not the same gametes. Well, that almost tells you exactly what I almost don't have to go on from there. You could write these definitions yourself, I bet now. Isogamous. Well, the gametes are going to look exactly like each other. There's the male gamete or the female gamete. There's the female gamete or the male gamete. You can't tell them apart. They look exactly the same. They're both mobile. And so we call them plus and minus or minus and plus. Who knows? <clears throat> so they are both mo identical, mobile gametes. Anisogamous is a little tougher. What's it mean that they don't look the same? They could not look the same in lots of different ways. In general, in anisogamous gametes, we have a small gamete with got flagella. And we have a bigger gamete that's got flagella. May not even be that big of a difference in size. So they are both mobile, so they are not identical. And they are both mobile. And isogamous. And all three of these types of gametes will occur then in the red algae.
the hardest part. We get all the exciting stuff first, and now we get to the conceptually a little more difficult part about cell divisions. Now again, you know cell division from a very limited number of organisms, basically from mammals and higher land plants. There's a lot more types of cell division than occur in mammalian systems and higher land plants. And we're going to talk about some of those divisions now. Now there are important terms that are associated with these types of divisions that are the terms that are emphasized in your book, and we'll get to those terms in a minute. I'll tell you what they are now so you know where we're going. Phragmoplast and phycoplast. Very confusing concepts and very confusing terms. Let's try to make them not confusing by putting them in the context of, cell of the cell divisions we've been talking about. And maybe the place we should start is the cell divisions of the things that you know, like the land plants, somewhat similar, in the, somewhat similar in the mammals. And in those cases, you know, when the nuclei divide, the first thing that happens is that the nuclear membrane breaks down. And a spindle forms. The chromosomes move apart on the spindle. And then nuclei reform in the new cells. So there's a spindle, and the nuclei are relatively far apart no nuclear membrane. There are actually two ways now that the cell division can happen in that kind of a system. So there we are. We're looking over here first with that uh, long-lived spindle and the nuclei far apart as they develop it. And there's two types of ways where the cell wall can form. Here's the cell wall grown in red. That's the cell wall. And this is the cell wall here. The two types of ways are the cell wall can grow in from the outside. Basically what's happening is that the formation of those, you're having Golgi, Golgi bring up lots of, Golgi vesicles bring lots of material up to the ends of those cell walls and they're extending inwards. Or those Golgi vesicles can aggregate at the center of the cell, that's over here, on this side, and the cell wall grows outward, or appears to grow outward from the middle. So those are the two types of division. We still haven't talked about fragmoplast and fragmoplast yet, but we'll come back to those. Let's look at the other case now that occurs only in the algae, does not occur in the higher land plants. There are cases where there's a short-lived spindle and the nuclei remain close together. And they remain close together also because in this case of cell division, of nuclear division, the nuclear membrane does not break down. So the nuclear membrane remains intact throughout the process of nuclear division. It's going to divide later on, so we get two nuclei, but it remains intact initially. If you've got the nuclear membrane intact and you've got the nuclei close to each other, the nuclei don't need a spindle to separate. The spindle is not necessary to guide them. There's a surprise, isn't it? Because you all learned that the spindle was necessary to guide the chromosomes apart to the two different poles of the cell. Apparently not. Algae are really interesting, and this is only the beginning. Of, we're not going to go into any of the really detailed physiology of how these things happen in the algae. I just whet your appetite for this. You'd have to go on to another university, I'm afraid, to really take a cool psychology course or algal physiology course where you would be able to think about these things. But there are a lot of really cool things that so far you think are impossible that these organisms do. And this is one of them. They have nuclear division, division of the chromosomes without a spindle, which is supposed to be essential. So the spindle is very short-lived. It does not function in separating the chromosomes, and the nuclei remain close together. Again, there are two ways the cell, the cell wall can form. Here is the one it forms from the outside, and here is the other it forms from the inside. Phycoplast and phragmoplast. 
We finally have to get to those terms, and we have the basis for doing that. On this side, we're going to have the phycoplast. On this side, we're going to have the phragmoplast. Phyco means seaweed. Plast, aha, plast, finally, we have this word. Actually, we've had it before. Plast, it is a ubiquitous root. Chloroplast, cytoplasm, protoplasm, nucleoplasm, plasm everywhere. What does plast mean? It is the same word that gives us our root plastic. Same Greek root gives us the word plastic. And it means something that is molded or formed. Something molded or formed. Why in the world are we calling the cytoplasm, the, the protoplasm, the chloroplast, something molded or formed? Now, I don't know the absolute answer to this, but here's my suggestion why I think this was. So remember, it goes back to why, we, why are we using Greek and Latin at all? English is the lingua franca, so to speak, of science. It is the language that every scientist speaks now is English. So why aren't we having, why aren't these names in English? Why are they in Greek and Latin? Because when science originated, more or less in England and Western Europe, the all educated people spoke or learned in high, college and high school equivalents, Greek and Latin. So they were all conversant in these languages of Greek and Latin. So a grade school student would have studied Greek, uh, who was going in the upper classes would have always studied Greek. So it was natural for them then to use the language that they knew to identify these structures. Now when the early microscopists looked inside of a cell, they didn't know what they were going to see. The first microscopes, they had no idea what was in there. It could have been just this amorphous stuff, you know, the, uh, the vital fluid. Life was something that was very mysterious. We didn't understand that we could form, we could make organic compounds for a very long time. So this, we could look into these cells and we might see this mysterious stuff, stuff that was in there and there may be no structure to it. God's creation at work. And people looked in there and what did they see? They said, oh my God, there's stuff in there. There's formed stuff in there. It's not just an amorphous material. There are... There's plast, there's plast in there. So they, the name chloroplast, all those things is because there was material inside the cell. Now, do I know this is absolutely true? No, but I transport myself back in time. It's a great story though. I believe that it is true. That's because I've told it so many times. I'm sure this is right. It's the only way that makes sense of this root plast. And I hope it helps remember the root plast because otherwise it makes no sense. So we have the phycoplast, the seaweed, something that's formed in, and it occurs in seaweeds, and something that is plast, and phragum means fence. In both the case of the phycoplast and the phragmoplast, we are talking about extra microtubules. We've talked about the spindles already. We know there's differences in the spindle in these two cases. Now we're talking about extra microtubules. In the case of the phycoplast, the extra microtubules are here and they are parallel to the new cell wall. And it's thought that these extra microtubules orient, help orient that formation of that new cell wall so it forms at the right place. You know microtubules do this kind of thing. Yes? When you say fence, what kind of fence are you talking about? Did I spell that wrong? Probably. I'm talking about the fence. Is that F-E-N-C-E? Yeah. Thank you. That type of fence. <clears throat> so they orient, the, they orient the new cell walls. 
That's in the phycoplast case. They are parallel to the new cell wall. In the phragmoplast case, they are perpendicular to the new cell wall, and they are cut by the cell wall. The cell wall comes out and it cuts those. And the function there is not so clear. And it does not occur in all of the cases where there's a long-lived spindle. It only occurs in some of them. But the ones that occur in, these are the land plants and their relatives. There are re and their relatives within the algae. And this is one of the reasons why we're going through all of this is because the presence of the phragmoplast is an indication that the organism we're looking at is closely related to the land plants. And that's when one of the major scientific questions in botany for ever since Darwin, how did the land plants originate? So here's the distribution of the cell types within our three classes. Physi is a class of algae. The chlorophyce, they have a phycoplast. The charophyce, ah, this is the one. This is going to be the group that's closely related to the land plants. They have a phragmoplast. And the oophyce, the third group, doesn't have either. It has no extra microtubules. Remember, these are not the normal spindle microtubules. These are extra microtubules. So in the oophyce, there are no extra, no extra microtubules. And that's the main, all of that was about getting to there. So we're going to start next time with talking about the chloro, not phyta, phyce, the class. And that's the class we'll be doing in class next week.